Good morning, also Johanna Ackermann. Um, just to, to kick off, uh, the, the first thing we wanted to, uh, what I wanted to say was that, uh, in fact, we are here in a debate uh, designing futures and showing nothing meaning more was a kind of uh, subtitle of the, um, the, the, the series of talks that we instigated. Uh, instigated these talks because uh, we are uh, changing our a uh, little bit our perspective as an institute and these three four topics we addressed here are like uh, a kind of kickoff uh, of a, a larger research that we start now um, designing futures um, uh, uh, the practice of exhibiting, but also how can an institute uh, be part of a discourse? How can an institute that is making exhibitions uh, play a role in the debate, uh, not only on uh, contemporary design or design itself, but uh, on soci societal developments? And because that is a kind of uh, key point of set 33 like how uh, can we look different to the world uh, to everyday life um, uh, and uh, how can an exhibition play a role in that but also how can other media play a role in that we are not experts we are not making uh, magazines or not uh, blogging or not uh, we are just making magazine uh, <laughs> exhibitions um, so we thought instead of uh, do this, uh, having this internal uh, discussion and research inside NZ33 uh, around the meeting table to share it with people that are around and using Milan instead of showing new things as uh, a platform to start that discourse. Um, Normally, we would have been here with uh, Walter Bettens of uh, Dam Magazine. This uh, whole talk was also, uh, or this uh, collaboration was a kind of um, construction, I can call it Dam Magazine. Um, and I have to say that um, the reactions were quite uh, hard, even. I can use that word, that we invited you uh, to be part of the, the talk. And the, probably, I think, because uh, I know I immediately kick off uh, the, the questions, probably because you are playing in the same small niche, even within the design, art, architecture field, you are say, um, almost having a kind of same approach. So two same products and the first time that things are tangible on the table this week, uh, two same products on the table, and they feel, or he felt at least a little bit in, uh, not at conflict. ease. Conflict. Yeah, in conflict, not comfortable. Mm. Interesting. Do you want yeah. me to reply to yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. Damn. <laughs> Well, obviously, I can't answer for Walter. I certainly didn't feel uncomfortable. I thought that it would be an interesting opportunity to discuss uh, a topic like uh, uh, design discourse, design critique, uh, with someone who's in the same field. Um, we obviously come from different perspectives, um, um, although we are both saying that we do recover design potentially in a more critical way. Uh, but I would say the fact that Diseño is a biannual and DAM is, I think, every second month, uh, that changes our um, perspective on things because we have a much more long-term view. Um, we also have a possibility to go in depth more because we have the possibility to write and rewrite and reconsider in the light of how a project develops. Um, and often that's the luxury that magazines published more frequently can do. Um, I guess um, w w within this space, um, w w why it could be seen, well, actually, no, I, 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 again, I shouldn't guess as, as, to what, as to what Walter was thinking, because I, <laughs> uh, I think it's a shame that, 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 that he's not here to have the debate, because I would have very <laughs> much actually appreciated it. So, um, and I can't really say more, more on that than that. 
on that subject. I'm looking in the two magazines that are just published. I see the same, uh, even on the front page, uh, the same names popping yeah, up. It's and interesting. Lino Bobardi. Uh, so I'm just mentioning one. Yeah. But that means that. Uh, also Martino Gamper, but yeah. he's not on our cover, but he's inside, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... Yeah. No, certainly, I mean, uh, th you know, that's something that uh, f for me is always an issue as well, that um, in the end, as design magazines, you end up covering the same content because of what's presented to you. Um, and I think... Um, Tamir, Tamar, Tamar, Tamar. <laughs> uh, Tamar, you, you, Tamar wrote um, a, an interesting kind of introduction, uh, introductory text to this talk, um, where you kind of looking at um, how we kind of use the same pool uh, in a very similar way within within design publishing. We all come to Milan, and instead of go, going to Hall Five, we all go to Hall Sixteen and Hall Twenty. Uh, once, for, for one reason is because it tends to be where the most well-known designers show and the most well-known brands. I heard just before yeah. you entered, Lynn, Lynn Greve, former a freelance journalist now, and she said uh, the last years I had to visit these halls because the, the, the advertisers are there <coughs> and we have to visit them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is the, the mechanism. Well, it depends on, of course, 16 and 20, I was going to get to that. Of course, 16 and 20 have the biggest brands that are also often have the biggest budgets to advertise. But, of course, you also go there because you tend to have the most interesting work. Um, however, there is a lot of things happening in the other halls, but for very different sort of reasons and for a very different audience. Uh, potentially, I mean, I, I said to someone last night, it'd be very interesting to know which hall actually makes the most money at the end of the week, because I'm sure it's very different. You know, uh, I think that maybe there are less sales going on 1620, not, not in money terms, but quantity terms, than potentially in other places. Apparently there are like children's beds shaped as Ferrari cars and things in hall six, sounds brilliant. But you know, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, say, I said that we, we we have this limited time to be here. We have five, five days. Uh, we often come with very many different hats on, which I think is one of the main problems of, of this. We, we go as journalists, which we try to do and we try to do independently. But uh, someone like me also goes as a publisher for, for my magazine, uh, where I have to represent it and where I do have to speak to the people that spend money on advertising. Um, and why that's important is because a magazine is not self-sustainable without advertising money. Um, the, the cover price doesn't cover the cost of producing Disenio. It's a very expensive product to produce. Mm -hmm. um, so this is part of the conflict, of course. Uh, but um, what I was going to say to answer your question to having the, the similar names and similar content. I think that's something you always battle with when you draw from the same pool. But for me, I think it's still important to cover the same things. It's just how you cover them that, that kind of is, is the real issue here. Uh, I'm often battling with people saying, oh, you can't write about that because the FT has an exclusive or wallpaper is doing that in April, so you're allowed to publish it in May. And um, that's a really frustrating thing because I don't want to do the same thing as them. I want to offer another perspective on the same project. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important. In fact, I think it's really interesting to read the Martino Gamper piece in Dam and the Martino Gamper piece in Desenio. And I think you'd be much wiser as to what Martino Gamper is up to by reading both. So I think it's actually a strength that some mm -hmm. of the content is the same. Yeah. And you're saying, yes, you were involved in Domus before? Yeah, Tamar Shafir. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, not not as an uh, employee, just no. as a, a freelance writer. Yeah. Um, but I guess it was. I, I think it was a bit different because I think as a freelance writer, you don't. You're really, really insulated from most of those concerns, and you don't even necessarily need to think like this has been published before, this is not a new product or stuff like that. Um, you're you're getting an assignment. Yeah, yeah. You're getting an assignment and even the perspective is uh, put on your plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know. I think, I think at the same time, I guess what I, what I tried to write with, with this text to, to 
look kind of at the, the question of the debate was like what, what is the purpose of the, the design critic in Milan? And I think what was interesting was that the question was posed, is Milan good or what does Milan do for design discourse? Um, and I found that in some ways quite an interesting question because in a way design discourse should follow what design is doing. And if Milan is the biggest event of design in the world for, for the moment, then in some ways the design critic or design journalist um, has the responsibility to look at the, the things there. And so it, in a way it's very, it's again very different from the, the independent freelance uh, writer's responsibility because you can really kind of cherry pick your, your particular interests and not, not necessarily have this, um, yeah, kind of a duty or responsibility to, not to the public, but in, I guess in a way it is almost like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was why I tried to switch the question in a way, because I think it's very difficult for me that a magazine or a newspaper would try to construct an alternative reality than what is actually in Milan. And then I think it's, it's useful that you say what happens in all the other halls where the, you know, Fancy journalists don't don't venture, but you know where maybe people are selling quite a lot of, of stuff, mm. <laughs> and and that should be questioned as well, I guess. But um, <coughs> one of my motivations is uh, of I was saying somebody asked me, uh, or oh, this is the most asked question. In fact, did you see something interesting? <laughs> yeah? mm. the, did I you? Hate that did, question. Yeah. So, <coughs> and in fact, um, like day one or I said yeah but I'm not here to strangely enough to see stuff I'm here to to talk to people I really want to to meet as many as possible people to see what is going on and to understand kind of evolution uh, of course in my right and left eye I, I see what is going on but um, that's not yeah, Bob. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think there's something quite problematic about that as well because I think I guess a, a something as well that I tried to write in here was that if people complain so much that there's so little interesting things in Milan, then I think that that is the subject for the publication. At the same time, that's in a way it's a very unattractive subject. I mean, I think I think criticism in that format can be quite ugly and quite um, unpalatable. And it can be very problematic for somebody who also has responsibilities as a publisher. I totally understand that. Um, but I also think that, that in, in that respect then, you almost need to look at the magazine itself as just another kind of product. I mean, and it has a very strong, for example, material quality and a very strong aesthetic quality. Um, and in that case, it, it is fair, I guess, that sometimes, um, not you know name calling, but really like directed criticism, where you're not necessarily worried to say this company is not doing anything interesting, or this company, or none of these companies are doing anything. But with in a in a in a more transparent way, as opposed to kind of keeping that discussion in the background and then just saying, oh, okay, Nendo did this, which was nice, and these people did this, which in a very uh, surface level. Um, I, I think that's that's very problematic, but it's also quite interesting then because if you start to think about the magazine itself as a product, then maybe the relationship of what the magazine does in a place like Milan can also evolve um, and can also kind of create its own events like, okay, this is not, uh, Z33 is not a magazine, but DAM is, and they are now kind of more creating content in Milan and not just uh, following after it. But I at the same time think that that is an issue, I'm going to say that, and we have created content in Milan, but um, uh, I do still think there's a slight problem in magazines involving themselves in a way where they feel they have to create content, because I think that, above all, the role of the journalist and the role of the writers that cover these fairs is to, to observe, and when it gets when it gets too conflicted, then I think it's difficult to keep that role. Um, the exhibition that we have done in Milan 
I think actually doesn't fall into that context t con context at all because it's something that why not um, just because it's something that reflects the content of the magazine it's something which is actually the, a continuation of something that we call the, the residency which we worked on with Natalie de Pasquier in, in three months for, for three months um, and it's kind of being able to to share some of what's in here and explain it a little bit better by giving a, a real experience of her work, which I think actually is added value. Um, and of course I would say that I'm, you know, it, it, it's my event, so, uh, you know, ple please, you know, protest, yeah, but, but, uh, but, but I mean, that, that's how I look at it. Uh, but I think w when there is too much emphasis on, on magazines creating content for other people to experience, first of all, uh, and already oversaturated schedule gets even more complicated to navigate and I'm not really sure what the added value is apart from as content creators for the magazine and then that kind of seems to be a strange kind of, kind of contradiction. We're here fed with loads of content already if you, you know, look, you know, that, that's, that's what we're here for. So I, I'm, I never quite understand that, that type of event. I mean, I, I don't necessarily sort of criticizing this event. You're not the only magazine eh, who's doing that, uh, organizing exhibitions, uh, creating content mm -hmm. yourself as a magazine, mm -hmm. um, on the opposite of uh, the street where you are, there is another magazine who does that already for years. Um, you, and there it's very obvious that it's a kind of... Um, not starting from uh, what I find a, a strong point of view or a position. Uh, it's really like uh, streamed or... Uh, in fact, as a as a service for their advertisers. Also your event is sponsored. Are you thinking about wallpaper handmade? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, for me it was obvious. It's <laughs> wallpaper on the other <laughs> side of uh, this right. Uh, I won't mention the brands, but it's okay. just um, uh, it's a service that they develop. Yeah. I mean it's a very popular service. All the brands love it. Um, I mean, it's interesting for me. I mean, I actually, I should also be before this becomes weird because actually, as a uh, as a magazine, we do create events. We create a salon series, as we call it. Um, we look. That's something that we do on our home turf in London every month. Um, however, the way that we look at that is. Uh, as a service to our readers where we, for example, offer them to come to a talk or to come to a film screening or to uh, visit a designer's studio. We, our emphasis on, on education, which I think is um, quite important within this world and something that I sometimes think is missing, the fact that you are um, offering a product to a readership that sometimes actually doesn't know a lot about design history or architecture history. And I think that magazines such as ours, which only comes out twice a year, can offer an, an interesting service in actually opening up these debates and, and saying, you know, like, what's happening now has happened before and why don't we look at that? Um, mm. and, and I think that, that, that that's something that I think it's far too little of out there in terms of the, the kind of educational aspect, learning, seeing, looking, looking to, to the past, also looking to the present and having these type of conversations. Um, uh, to answer to the to, to the sort of critique you had of uh, of the exhibition of, of the other magazine that we were talking about, yeah, I mean it's it, wallpaper. It, well, <laughs> it, um, it's it's obviously wallpaper. I think within um, uh, the the design world, uh, in, in a more sort of um, cons broad consumer magazine market is a, a very big product you know it's it's um it probably has m well it has the ear of most of the advertisers i mean we always have people comparing us to them when we speak to brands and and i think i mean they're so vastly different i don't think there's any, even any point trying to compare it but of course they um, they need to build on on that uh, brand value that they have and that they and they, the position they have in that market and when they can say to a brand listen mm -hmm. we can give you some really added value here by 
teaming you up with a designer and let's create an interesting project and you're going to have loads of people coming to a yeah. party and you know of course that's attractive um, what then and what it then ends up being or you know what happens with this project in the long run I think is problematic because yeah. it seems to just be for the moment and it seems to just create more stuff yeah. without actually kind of critically looking at why why yeah, yeah. what is the need of this um, I want to come back to um, an interesting uh, what I find interesting on Diseño is that you create kind of different speeds. You have that website which is going fast and now and we want it now. And on the other side you have like this uh, biannual um, almost book with SS. Why not making that difference bigger? Because um, there is something I think which is really um, with these assess, because they are, they're not just articles of two pages or three pages, they are like six pages, ten pages, uh, and so on. So this different speed, this different depth also uh, creates an interesting friction and also says something how did you use um, the medium in an interesting way. Mm. I mean, to be honest, we're learning all the time. Um, and I don't profess that we do anything in the right way. I think that for me, this Enyo is a project where I'm learning as much as the people around me when we create it, and that's something that I really enjoy. Um, I am working with it because the industry that I that I happen to have chosen a profession in uh, is one that actually interests me a great deal. Um, the, the, the people that I meet, uh, the projects that I see, uh, what impact they have on society in general um, and so on. It's something that I constantly find myself being very fascinated by. Um, and um, Diseño is a learning curve for me as much as for everyone else. So you saying, you know, why don't we make the, the, the speed difference bigger and so on, I think that's a really interesting proposition. <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, it, it's a movable feast. It's something that uh, we, we constantly kind of battle with. I mean, to, just to, to, to give you an insight into our rea reality, uh, Diseño's editorial team is made up of myself and one other yeah, full-time member I want of The scale, eh? maybe this yeah. looks impressive, but it's uh, the scale of is yeah, it's very, very small. small. It's yeah. very, very small. And we would love to do much more. I'd love to have a team of not 10, but maybe, you know, I'd like to have at least two more people working with me and we would be able to realize some more of the ideas that we we have, um, but in what, when you're addressing this kind of difference in, in 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 size, time, and so on, what are you referring to exactly? Why not making the difference bigger? What is it that you're referring to exactly? Yeah, I was referring to Twitter, a, an example. interesting topic you ad were addressing, and it's the educational part, mm -hmm. because there something happens uh, or where that um, a magazine, a book, uh, plays a very important role in uh, the thinking, changing mentalities, uh, having new insights and so on. So I found that very interesting that you see it as almost like a, a book for a school or uh, that is an interesting that after some years you still can take it out of your uh, and then you look back into it and you so that becomes a reference so they are also m almost written like essays uh, they are not just uh, articles uh, they are uh, or that are th I found it strange that you said in the beginning I, I noted that is um, you you take what is presented to you why not, uh, and that's maybe the difference how that I walk around in, um, in Milan, I look what I find. What it's a, it's a st so I'm not, um, I do not search even, I just find on the street, on the <laughs> and then I pick up, as a, but then I'm curating at that moment. It's a really good idea to uh, separate it more because I think in the whole, uh, magazine will change in value um, if you take away all the disturb like all the small articles and you would publish that online 
that is kind of a, because it's such a different thing, like, and everything which is pumped in the world, like, by media, it, it, you, you pay less attention to it. And if you skip that out of the magazine, then the magazine gets a lot of value, I think. And uh, then it's something you really want to keep and you also want to buy. And then you also um, see it, I think, more as a... Um, um, yeah, as, as something you're really looking forward to getting it, you know, like a present you get monthly or or twice and uh, twice a year. Yeah, <laughs> twice a year. This one. Yeah, I think that that could even uh, be a better position for a magazine as well, too. No, so I mean it's that is an interesting proposition, and I think that type of magazine exists. I'm not magazine. I think it exists in the shape of journals, but that they tend to deal with topics a little bit more. Academically. Academically, often kind of also anchored very much in history often, if it comes to like, for example, I'm thinking of the design history journal and so on. Um, it's interesting because I, I the, we're within this, I mean, you know, again, this is my personal project, so it also is influenced by what I like and how, how, how I look at the world. And I love magazines. And for me, there's a certain rhythm to looking at a magazine. There's a certain certain um, expectation of what it should be. And I don't like the uh, well. I don't like to sort of delve in the deep end from the beginning. You need like a little warm up. You need like a few shorter pieces to just sort of you know, get the readers started. It doesn't mean that they have to be, they, you know, we have a piece in here which is one of my favorites, which is a one page long, uh, but what it says is, you know, it's by Nina Power, uh, it's on um, design and porn, which is a weird uh, new uh, genre in, in design publishing, uh, which has appeared in the sort of last year. Um, where basically you're trying to kind of disguise the fact that you're looking at naked butts next to, by placing them next to beautiful design objects, which is... Um, but Playboy it, started like that, eh? No, yeah. of course. That was almost all of them, uh, an interior all, all magazine. Of them, eh? All of them refer back to Playboy and the mm. hater of Playboy. Hey, we're 2014. I don't think we should really be kind of even trying to emulate Playboy anymore, you know. So, um, no, so, so that's a really important piece, but we couldn't make that 16 pages long. I wouldn't be interested in it. I'm interested in her thousand words uh, in an opinionated fashion. No, but it's and not about the, about the size or the length of an article. I think you could go even more farther in it that you skip all the advertising and that's going to be an online thing. So the book gets more attention and all the disruption will go away. And then the events you create next to the magazine, they will become more worth it even because you, you, you make a better structure in the whole. And if you separate that more, then it becomes such a clear concept and I think that could be a very good perspective for it. But it's interesting that, because I think that what, what we come down to then really um, is how you build a business and what your business model is. Um, I have um, a very good friend of mine who publishes a magazine called Vestoy or Vestoch, uh, who uh, on clothing, which is mm -hmm. a, a journal on, on, on sartorial matters is the tagline. Yeah. Um, she has decided to not have any advertising. In fact, she published a manifesto in her first issue saying that she won't kind of pander to advertisers, she won't pander to the design brands, uh, so, and the fashion brands primarily in this case. And, you know, it's taken a very long time for her to build it to where it is, but eventually she now got... Uh, um, uh, uh, well, she started working with London College of Fashion uh, to, to, to produce it. So she has uh, an um, educational institution behind her in either, or, order to do that, which I think is wonderful and it's a really nice position to be yeah, in. Yeah, I think it's also really interesting because then you're really standing on your own instead of if we're just talking about following, like I think you were saying it, that you could uh, follow the, de the design week or you just being the leader and you create the events yourself, you know, like the, the content. And I think that's happening then because if you would skip, like now you are actually following the kind of main brands um, by publishing it. But if you would stand on yourself, you became much more, yeah, I think, I know it's, I know it's necessary. Uh, <laughs> in order to also there is a there is a 
Uh, an example that it's maybe not necessary. But then you also have to consider, I mean, the magazine that I did uh, bring up, for sure. I think that there are a lot of interesting, uh, uh, I mean, cabinet is another one. Uh, yeah. But, you know, um, again, that doesn't necessarily engage with contemporary culture as such. You know, it's, it's um, a quirky take on, on different themes. However, I think that there's another potential issue there. I mean, I don't know at all, but, you know, educational institutions are also brands, you know, you know, why would they be supporting a magazine? It's because they want to make sure that they get more students all over the world signing up to their college because that's how they make money. So somewhere along the line, there's always a business model. There's always money that has to change hands. Of course, I agree, we can do it more sophisticatedly than by advertising. Yeah, but then it becomes also a little bit, the subtleness also makes it, yeah, makes it a hidden agenda so that you cannot see it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. or you do it very obvious or... I think that now it's, it's impossible to have this clean, clean division. I think it doesn't exist. I mean, even I think that many of the people I know, who, for example, went into design analysis or design journalism, studied design themselves and they are friends with designers and design was their first passion, for example. Or again, as you say, schools. Mm -hmm are not necessarily kind of this um, ivory tower, totally insulated partner, but they also have their own logistical concerns. Um, and I think it's, what I think what's difficult is that you no longer can assume, uh, especially kind of even the more I, I kind of get involved, this it's still kind of a new industry for me, and now I'm even not doing it so much, maybe doing our, our own work a bit more. Um, but the more I get into it, the more I understand how complex the interweavings are. Um, and what's, I think what's difficult is that m you, not necessarily everybody knows those hype, those links or those flows or those influences. But the other difficult thing is that even as somebody who, who <coughs> maybe is informed of those, um, you're forced to, to, every time you encounter something, you have to kind of start again and try to analyze it with a fresh mind because you cannot count on the fact that, you know, in, in wallpaper, uh, there'll be a kind of more, maybe, you know, light article and in Domus, there'll be a more heavy article. I mean, those things change so quickly mm. and depending on the, the writer. I mean, I see you're holding uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> Could example. you explain this? <laughs> sure, sorry. To cough into the microphone. Um, <laughs> this is um, well. It's quite small, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but I recently gave a, a lecture in Eindhoven about the question of the critical format because um, I was trying to speak to the students who I see one here um, about the two sorry um, about the the question of how their work, for example, might be written about eventually in different formats and what the necessities and potentials of each format are. Um, and I also said, in, in some ways, you also have to be very critical of the, the format itself. Um, and so I actually uh, brought up the example of Dzine, which recently started this um, line of editorial columns. Mm -hmm. um, so again, for example, you used to think, okay, Dzine, it's, it's publishing um, or broadcasting kind of basically press releases without, um, uh, very consciously without and selling watches, editorial filter, and selling watches, and partnering with Mini, and also advertising, and all this stuff. Um, but then at the same time I said, okay, now you know they have this um, kind of editorial uh, vision in some specific articles, um, but I also said, okay, even when you look at the press release, and your goal maybe is to get your project on Dzine and that's kind of the way you're going to get the biggest audience. I, I tried to do like a color coding of the website. Oh, it's even too, it's quite long. Should but I um, it? Sure. <laughs> I'm trying to remember actually what the different parts were. Um, that would help. Black was, black was kind of just pure content um, in terms of this is, this is projects. Then I think blue was self-promotion. Um, Green was, I believe, no, uh, maybe blue is advertising. And pink is comments uh, or editorial views. Um, sorry, I should have, <laughs> you should have warned me. <laughs> I was going to do it. Shows the proportion, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was a kind of really insane, um, uh, inter not, not just the proportions, but also the interweaving of what the different kinds of contents were. So it wasn't that you can look at Dizine and say, like, 
okay, here is where the project is, and here's where the advertising is, and here's where the self-promotion is. Um, uh, yeah, there was self-promotion in there as well. Um, Please. It's, yeah, it's yeah. not only uh, um, these proportional amounts. So you see, okay, you almost have a structure there. There's a column uh, of this kind of uh, black content, in a sense, unfiltered content provided by the designer. And then on that column, uh, almost like a structure again, is piled all of this other stuff, um, which in the end is... Your, is kind of being filtered into your brain as you're reading this. Um, but even the way they're totally interwoven, there's no way, you have to be really um, paying attention to kind of see how the divisions are. And it's quite clever the way they do it because you're thinking about design and then you're reading about watches and about mini and you're not necessarily always sharp enough to, to think, okay, no, I can ignore this, I can ignore this, I can ignore this. And even the content itself, you can say, well, I can also ignore this because the designer just wrote this about their own work. Um, and then the comments, you can also say, I can ignore this because it's just, um, well, kind of facile remarks from people. But sometimes they're the most interesting thing there. Um, but I think it's, it's a really complex, it, it seems so simple, like this, this format, and then it's actually incredibly uh, intricate and, and dense in a way. And, and demands, I think, quite a lot of Faculty, and, and, then, and then in some way that, I, I think it's, it's fine to not have this kind of clean uh, division again between publishing and criticism and advertising. I think it's impossible, but I also think um, this reveals how kind of dense that, that mesh is. The button which says advertising on the zine, then it gives you the various options of where you can place your advertising, one of them being within the editorial content so that becomes even more complex then so is what you read there paid for or, or not paid for is it done by editorial selection by the editorial team or is it the sales team that has sold that story in you know with as it promises an infinite lifespan on its website um, you know so yeah, so I think it's even, but, but you know, not, not just the zine, I, you know, I think that goes for, 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 for many different uh, uh, publications, both online and printed. Um, the, the boundaries are very, very, very vague. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I see the complexity of uh, bringing the discourse on the different uh, platforms, uh, as we mentioned, from magazine, book to uh, website, but... Um, I would like to hear what is your, both uh, your critique, no, what is your definition of critique, in fact? What, what is, because, Evelo, it's not fair that I, we are only almost uh, discussing and commenting now Disenio, but you said we have a, a critical point of view. What is that? What is that position then? What is the, the way in or or looking to, yeah. Yeah, um, so as a magazine, I mean, well, critical point of view, so it's interesting. I mean, critique doesn't need to be negative. I think mm -hmm. it just needs to be looking at something for well, what it is, but that doesn't, doesn't necessarily cover it. But I mean, looking at it from many different angles and making sure you really try and understand the topic. Um, and I think that that's why we say um, we, we dedicate ourselves to long form, in-depth journalism. Uh, because we try to, m m in many other areas of publishing, uh, there is often a process that uh, you have to go through in terms of research and interviews um, and fact-checking and so on that somehow sometimes seems less rigorous within our field um, and, that, and within design publishing. Uh, and I think that's a shame. So I think that we we see it in this, you know, this sounds like marketing spiel, but we see <laughs> ourselves uh, as a magazine that um, kind of try to add quality back into design writing by applying the principles that you have in many other different sectors. Uh, that includes criticism and, and, and critiquing, but it's also, um, um, for example, well, um, actually interviewing people rather than just going through a press release, which sometimes actually happens. Uh, for example, we would never write a story uh, in the magazine if we haven't 
personally, um, us or the writer that we commission, have seen or experienced or been there. You know, we, 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 I, I've been in my previous job at Icon, I wrote no. endless stories uh, on architecture of buildings that I'd never seen in real life, you know, and then when I, I didn't did have the budget to send you there. <laughs> yeah, no, no magazines do. I mean, the, I mean, that's another thing that we can talk about. But let's, let's anyway. Uh, but um, so, so for us, it's, for us, it's super important to uh, to uh, have that first-hand experience because I think that that's the starting point for any good writing is that you need to at least have experienced it, you know, and and, and have like a first hand approach to it and then you can take it where you want but unless you've done that then I don't think you can even start um, and just one more thing um, <laughs> uh, we try to um, we try to create good writing as well I think that this is something that I feel is quite um, unsatisfactory at times when I read magazines that you don't think of the narrative arch, you don't think about that there's actually like a poor reader at the end of it that is supposed, to is supposed to follow the argument from beginning to end. If you don't help them along the way, they're going to put the magazine down. Um, and you mentioned that we have very long sort of essay-like features and I think that that's, um, we try to do that but we try to do that without boring or turning people away. Uh, we try to be engaging uh, in the way that we do that. Whether we're successful or not, I can't say, but that's, that's the, uh, the kind of point of view. I mean, again, well, sorry, one more thing, because you said that we have similar content within the two magazines. You mentioned Lina Bobardi. I mean, so I think the, 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 the kind of real difference here is that our Lina Bobardi feature, I think it's 16 pages long, not all with text, but it's probably a 4,000 word essay versus probably 400 words in this one. So I think that that's, that's the depth that I'm talking about and that's something we can do being out only twice a year. You were saying at least we tried to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, at this moment, yeah, I know Jana Scholze. Uh, she is a fantastic person, writer, uh, curator, conservator of Victorian Albert Museum, mm -hmm. um, commenting or not really commenting, because that was impossible at that time. At that moment, she was working on the article. Um, writing about an in other institute and an exhibition she didn't saw. Mm -hmm. And it's in here. No, but the article is not about the exhibition. The article is about Constant Gwittich and his practice. Um, with the news hook, which is a nice little term we use in journalism, being the upcoming exhibition. So, in fact, uh, it's very clear saying that it's not trying to be uh, giving a critique of the exhibition, it's trying to give an insight into his and his co-curator's thinking process and through that examining how he works, not just with this exhibition, but what his practice is as a designer. So, I'm sorry that criticism doesn't hold. No, 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 but it's to, to clarify no, how no, these uh, yeah. complexities work. And no, how of course, that, uh, yeah, yeah, no, and I totally see what you're saying, but mm -hmm. in, in this particular case, that's not what the article is trying to do. Okay, so... Um, somebody else? Questions? Yeah, Line? Well, I think the critique is all about uh, criteria, actually, and uh, you never mentioned any yet. Maybe we can talk about that. The or what are the, what are the different criteria in different uh, um, media or something about criteria? I don't know if it's exactly the sense of criteria, but I think for, for me there's three very clear kinds of, of critique that can be practiced. And I think they all have very different um, motivations or, or heritages. Um, I think one form of critique is aesthetic critique, and uh, just personally, I think it's the the one that is the I know the least about, um, and that probably I have no experience with. And I think that actually it's the one that's the most difficult, and maybe even the least fashionable at the moment, um, because I think aesthetic theory has become so removed from uh, a kind of mainstream level. Uh, it's become so ensconced in like very, very high level academic fields that there is almost no way to translate between mm -hmm. the, this very, very rarefied philosophical tradition and something like how do you understand 
a table. Um, and so in a way, there's a kind of practice of taste, I think that happens in, in something like design magazines, um, but which I think it's not, it's very uh, uh, reserved, very tacit, and not, not expressed in a very um, outright way, because I think it's, it's also people, I think, are frightened to make um, aesthetic judgments in such a public way. Um, I think another form of critique is um, just, f which maybe is, uh, as a, speaking again personally, maybe the usually the way I write is like, why, why did somebody make that? Um, and I think that that has several consequences that that approach because if you ask why did somebody make that, you can't just look at the object. You also have to look at who is financing this person. Um, where is this person from? What is the context that they're showing this object? Where do they want this object to go after? What responsibilities do they have? What are their other projects that they've done? So how does this change and reflect on, on the continuing line of work? Um, and then in this way, it's, it's strange because the object becomes very small, actually, somehow, in that, in that story, even though I think it's the most, one of the most interesting ones for me. Um, and I think that that line of, of criticism became very um, uh, kind of, I think it began sort of in, in art history when people stopped looking just at uh, paintings, but they tried to interpret, for example, the iconography of paintings as representations of the society at the time, um, especially, for example, the economic class or the social class of the, of the person who painted the, the work. Um, which, in, again, it's, uh, what, what I don't like about this form is that you also, it leaves quite little room for the pure creativity of the person making. Um, and The craziness. Yeah, 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 bec and the kind of random chance in a way. Isn't it also a bit like justifying sometimes the uh, work, finding, uh, looking for reasons why uh, is the work like that and then sometimes even justifying some... <laughs> Some bad work, yeah, but, but well, I don't. I'm not saying necessarily bad things, but uh, yeah, whoever. I don't. I don't know if it's just looking yeah. for the justification. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't know if it's justifying it because I think I mean it already exists. I think it's just trying to explain that in a yeah in a bigger. How does it come? Yeah, 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 and I mean even like, I don't know why. Yeah, <laughs> explain this table, Jan. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I don't, sponsored. I don't know. Sponsored, sponsored by, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's quite, it's, yeah. there's a lot of room for legs, so that's nice. Yeah. Um, and then I will say finally that the last form of, of criticism, which I think is also quite interesting, but it's, it's, it's really the one that belongs to criticism the most, and I wonder how designers relate to this, is um, the critic arriving and looking at an object without knowing the designer, without knowing the story, and using only their own experiences and critical faculties to to understand the the work and then I think you see kind of this associative kind of writing or um, for example uh, when we were speaking I think for the the catalog for for Konstantin Gretich mm -hmm. how for example his work deals with interior space and public space mm -hmm. I don't know if that has anything maybe he has nothing to think he doesn't ever think about that when he when he does but we, it may we, be ha we had other thoughts about yeah, it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it, we've had similar conversations with uh, Forma Fantasma in the um, uh, interior discussions because we were speaking about domesticity. And I said, okay, for, for, for me, your work deals a lot with that because you often deal with things like the kitchen, with making things at home, with kind of traditional mm. practices. And they said, oh, okay, I, for us, domesticity is not that important. Um, and then I think in that form, the critique is really its own product, because there you see maybe the most creative work, or the most um, possibilities, even if it's, um, and then uh, also kind of very curious topics like the this pornography and design could be an interesting one. Yeah. I don't know if that's the criteria you were looking for. Maybe. No, that, that is the system of critique, in fact, yeah, or that there are the, the, the tactics and the strategies of tactique. The, the criteria is where I think you are pointing is what is good or what is bad. How do you, no? Okay. But if I, I thought that was the question, if I look to that, I don't have, I just um, take my own um, reference as a reference, um, not the reference, but a reference to read on, uh, on all the three levels you are describing. Uh, so that's for me the criteria. 
Um, hmm? I want, um, yeah, Joanna, you, you still want it? No, no, I'm, no, I'm, no. No. <laughs> Thank you. I, I also say, I though, I mean, it's, I think what's curious, if you read, I know this is, a, I mean, such an obvious reference, but if you read something like um, Adolf Loos, like it's, you just can't imagine anybody writing like that now. Mm. And, in a, and you can't, nobody would say, like, how dare people add this decorative junk on stuff, and it's so horrible, and we're such a crude and primitive society if we, you know, uh, adorn our work with these needless things and we've you know become so decadent and and so removed from our moral underpinning like who would write that now you know it's such a strange but that is a very clear criteria about design uh. maybe I can try to uh, explain but better the first uh, two uh, approaches that you said there are there are really uh, criteria that are quite clear like you said, from the history of uh, architecture, philosophy, etc. And the third approach, we don't know nothing about the context, about the author and everything. There you really need some, like, criteria, let's say criteria. How, do you, how, you, how would you call it otherwise? No, like, what are there, the... There you're, then the self-referential yeah. position, yeah, yeah. your own... Um, but is it always possible to... to why not? Give such a great, yeah. Yeah. I was asking. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I definitely. Would. I think that, that that type of critique... I mean, well, I was going to say it was interesting when, as you say, when the critic only uses his own kind of, you know, his own knowledge and, and don't necessarily know so much about the person or, you know, the context behind it. We do rely an awful lot on speaking, going directly to source and speaking to the designer and the practitioner, and that that's you know that's tainted with all kinds of issues as well because they communicate what they want to communicate about themselves and the project, and you know, I mean you know so by just sort of going for your for, for your own kind of um, uh, opinion on something that get that can sometimes be very free from f from that kind of loaded. Ness, I think, of uh, of being kind of fed a story by a designer or, or, or a designer, well, the the person who's who's, who's done the work, um, and it's easy to rely on on interviews in some ways. It's in some ways, I mean, I, you know, I can, but when you when you write a piece, it's often very um, pleasant to have a, a transcript to refer back to and put in a few quotes. But you know, what what do they actually mean? You know. How, how, how do they engage with what you really want to say and how do you up, make up your own mind around these things and can you really once you've had that interview and that discussion with someone because you're already then so influenced. So uh, I think as you say that that, that, that last line of, of criticism is an interesting one and one that we actually don't see an awful lot of uh, in writing nowadays. And um, But I think there's also a reason for there not being so many people like Adolf Loos writing now. Mm. <laughs> Every, a lot of people are afraid of the consequences. For sure. Yeah. And designers thinking. cannot express themselves anymore. As uh, in that time, it was very clear. Of course, he had a position in the moment he wrote these texts. Uh, but now the situation is so different that they are entangled. They, are, uh, they have to position themselves, they cannot be outspoken, they have to be diplomatic, um, be careful, because 10 years later, this can be used against you. But also, you know, you have to then also look at, you know, who did he write for, who actually read it, you know, how widely disseminated was it, you know. Nowadays, you're looking at a post on the scene, which obviously isn't criticism, but, you know, that reaches, reaches millions of people instantly, and that has to somehow be easily, more easily digestible, I guess. And, and that, that's when, when it comes down to what, what does the medium do for the quality um, mm -hmm. of the piece? You know, it seems that, it seems like there's some correlation. It would be quite interesting to kind of look at that graph, what it looks like, you know, when you have to please the wider audience, you know, what does it do for what you actually can say and what you can go into depth with because you, the the more out of flows you are, the less readers you're gonna have. Yeah, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. Well, he had a, he had enough readers. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, but he, he had he's order, at a hundred yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> the responsibility or the consequences of critique um, 
do you sometimes think about this, or is this a continuous, like in your, in the back of your head, uh, yeah, a, a of concern? Course. I'm curious, yeah. also uh, jumping on that question, like, uh, do you are you ever conscious that something you're going to publish is going to create conflict in a way? For sure, I mean, it happens all the time. I have had two people threatening to sue the magazine in the last year for something we've written, and we're not even that critical. I mean, like, you know, I sometimes I, I wish we were more. Again, it's a process of sort of finding your place and finding your voice in some ways. Um, I think, yeah, you always have to consider it. You always have to consider your battles to some degree, um, you know, how you... Um, what it means to uh, to publish something, what effect it will have on the person that you write about, what effect it will have on um, the relationships you're building with, with other people in the industry. Um, I mean, as a general rule, I think that um, you shouldn't consider it too much. You know, you need to be able to express y your opinion of something truly and honestly. Uh, but I think that there also needs to be a consideration yeah, for who you do it and, and you know, if, if it's just about flexing your muscles and showing how clever you are and, you know, then no. But if it's of real value for people to, uh, for you to share these opinions with, with your reader, then I think it's, then it's a really good thing, um, of course. But um, I was going to get something there, but I kind of lost it. Um, responsibility. Um, no, I, may, maybe continue talking something else, I'll get back to it. There was that some, definitely a point. No, yes, actually, yes. It was something that you uh, talked about here, um, and which I think is relating to it. Uh, basically, um, I think that in the end, that type of critiquing and who comments on it, it becomes really quite an insular kind of feel like you're not you're not necessarily having a broad discussion at that point you know so the more speci specialist it gets the, the the kind of less engaging i think you you are with a broader broad, broader audience and i think maybe that's a shame i think that we, it, because then it becomes just a, a kind of play for a play of critiquing for critiquing's sake and you know we can sit here and talk for hour, for hours but what does it influence and what does it change because i presume that you want to you you, you want to have some of those objectives with what you do that you know that things get better or that there is or, or, you know that that there's some mm -hmm. outcome from yeah. what you're writing yeah. but if 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 you kind of only do it as a show off to your direct peers which i think sometimes happens a lot um you know, you kind of consider, instead of considering like, you know, I don't know, an anonymous reader in China, I'm considering uh, Kieran Long at the VNA, you know, or, you know, like, you know, you have specific people in mind that you want to impress or that you yeah. want to appeal to. And, and then that, 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 that becomes um, also problematic, I think. So, so um, I can't remember exactly what, but you, what you wrote actually in here, but it was. <laughs> are you going to publish this with the with the talk? Because I it think is, it's a yeah, yeah, really yeah. good starting it's off point. It's always the introduction yeah. of every uh, discussion. Yeah. There are also in the flyers there. Okay. But uh, that is kind of starting kickoff of uh, discussion that's going on, mm -hmm. and um, that's what we, as as an institute, of course, uh, we broadcast we are starting to broadcast now we are starting to publish we are starting so it's not only this exhibition itself as uh, as a tool to uh, communicate and be part of um, but we also change our um, formats uh, and there we are looking now how we can change them that's the reason why uh, this discussion started, it's part of our research um, and you have to see in what kind of directions, what kind of media we can go and to make, uh, to make possible to, in other ways that public can understand uh, everyday life in different ways uh, by different media. Can I just say one thing which I think is a huge problem uh, around design criticism is that we don't have it enough uh, in daily press we, you know like the Guardian has gotten rid of most of their kind of specialist writers on architecture and design 
Um, I, I actually call from thinking of my, 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 my mother country, Sweden, we don't have any experts at any of the bigger newspapers that actually write critically and engagingly about the design topic. And I mean, I can sort of, you know, Alice Ralston is kind of the example that really stands out that writes for a broad publication such as the New York Times. And I think it's when, you, when you're missing that from a kind of readily accessible daily news press, then I think that we have so much more to, 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 that we have to build on there. And I think without that kind of even being a consideration for many newspapers nowadays because of slashed budgets and so on, I think that the, a real design discourse is, and a real engaging one is really difficult to achieve. Um, because again, I don't think it should just happen within these forums, in, you know, where you're kind of preaching to it already converted. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need to open it up to a, a larger audience in order for it to have some impact. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something that I, I, I really miss. And um, I, I have this book um, called, I think it's The Guide to the New Millennium, which is uh, the collected writings of J.D. Ballard for The Guardian, The Independent, in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and, you know, you don't get that. You don't often get that writing nowadays within that more mainstream media. And I think that that was writing that so many people could engage with and did and had, you know, a direct sort of... Um, opinion about or a, a re reflection on or reaction to and um, yeah and I, I think that that's something that I can sort of only feel very sad about yeah great yeah I, and that's strange, also I was gonna say the strange thing as well is that at the same time some form of design press or promotion or public, I can't really describe it, but there is a kind of idea about, des about design being heavily propagated, like online with very, very image-oriented uh, social media or, or different kind of websites that kind of curate content. But again, it's totally missing that critical level. It's, just, it's really just like kind of snapshots. Mm. I don't know. Um, I think that's, that's what's strange. But, and, and I also think that, for example, last, last summer I went to, to visit my brother in San Francisco and I actually anticipated being able to speak to people there in almost, not a similar language, but to kind of really understand them because, I don't know, based on something like going to Design Academy, looking at very kind of uh, societal concepts or ways that people um, live together or organize information and things like that and it was a completely different language like it was not even language but motivations and self-reflection and it was very difficult to find any meeting point there so it's even more insular than I than I thought it was before it uh, gives immediately uh, the work that still has to be done or where uh, what we maybe also as an institute a little bit can instigate uh, or be part of that, uh, facilitating that uh, part of the, the discourse um, and making it more public. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tamar Shafir. Thank you, Jona okay. Ackerman. And Thank you. Um, uh, comment it on our website, uh, z33research.be. Thank you.